You may not be surprised to find me up here, but I am. <laughs> when I had done 50 years from my ordination, I decided the time had come to stop taking services. Um, I knew of many ministers who didn't know when to stop. Their congregations would have told them, but they didn't ask them. <laughs> And we've been here for 10 months now. And two weeks ago, on the Sunday morning, I was saying to the Lord, um, show me how you want me to serve you, Lord, in this new church you brought us to. And I walked into church and Mary said, will you take the service in two weeks' time? <laughs> so I thought, well, Lord, you can't be clearer than that, so here I am. And the key verse I want to share with you this morning is verse 16. It's a big chapter, this chapter 3, and we haven't the time to go through it bit by bit. There's too much there. But I think the key verse is the verse that we've just had written on the board. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And I want to look at three points. Uh, the fact to depend upon, the friends to serve, and the temptation to flee. When John wrote this letter, he was well on in years. He was probably the only one of the 12 disciples still alive. The church was under attack from the Romans and also within its own ranks there were many whose teaching was false and were seeking to, to lead it astray. And today the church is still under attack. The persecution in the church of Jesus Christ is greater in our age than it's ever been in any other age before us since Christ walked the earth. In our own land the faith is has been forsaken by the majority and Christians are mocked for their beliefs. They're treated as narrow-minded for their ethics and the secularists and the humanists proudly claim that they're gradually amending the laws of our land and the practices of the land to eliminate Christianity from all influence in national affairs. Yet, why should we be surprised at that? Scripture teaches us that in the last days, the majority will turn away. It teaches us that the evil one will dominate increasingly before Christ returns. And John's message, therefore, is a message to us. Its purpose is to point us in the right direction. So that we don't fall away when the testing time comes, as it is coming, but to stand firm in the faith and to continue to bear witness to the Christ so that we are found faithful when he comes. So note firstly, there is a fact to depend on. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The death of Christ on the cross to pay the price of our sin is basic to our whole faith and practice. It's the reason crosses adorn our churches. They're to remind us that the cross is central to our Christian beliefs. When we acknowledge our sinful ways and we come in repentance before the cross of Jesus Christ and ask him to cleanse us and come and live within us, we say we've been born again. That is, we're made a new person. And in verse 1 of this chapter, we read, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Now you might say, well, we're all children of God. Well, that's true by creation. He's the giver of life. But 
this verse that speaks of us as children of God is not with regard to God as creator, but God as redeemer. We are adopted into his family. We become his children. Jesus is his son. And so, as a child of God, you become a brother or sister of Christ himself. You become princes and princesses of God the King. Have you ever thought of yourself like that? <laughs> then IV says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. It's a bit weak, that C. Authorised version got it right. Behold, it says, behold what great love the Father has lavished on us. It's something to think about in awe. It's a miracle that's taken place in your life and in mine. Think of it deeply. Think of it often. It's a wonder second only to the fact that Christ laid down his life for us. He did it for you before you were born, before you were even thought of. What love he had. You complete the deal when you come before him in confession <coughs> and repentance and ask him to apply what he has done in your life. It's a bit like the electricity around the building. It's all there. But it's only effective when you switch the switch and the light appears. Christ died on the cross for your sin and for mine. But it's only effective in each of us as we give our lives to him. It switches on. Result, you're a child of God. Wonder. Amazement, the fact to depend upon. When Jesus comes again, you'll be lifted up to him. Verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. We do often wonder what heaven's going to be like. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Transformed into his likeness. Now we want to live for Christ. Now we want to be like him. Now we struggle to reflect him and fail so often. But then it will happen. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. His glory, his righteousness, his purity, his nature will be reflected in us. It's a bit like a mirror. When you gaze in the mirror, what do you see? You're not conscious of the mirror. You're conscious of the image, yourself, looking back at you. When Jesus comes... He will look at you, the mirror, and what will he see? He will see a reflection of himself in you. Wonder of wonders. A fact to depend on. Fill your heart with praise. For this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. But secondly, I want us to think about the friends to serve. I say friends because it started with F and that fitted in nicely. But it's wider than just friends, those we know best and like best. For verse 16 goes on, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The friends to serve. Why does John apply this? wonderful fact like that 
Because when you come to Christ by faith and yield your life to his control, he comes and lives in your heart. And by his spirit, he starts to change and transform your life to be more like him. What is he like? He laid down his life for us. When we pray what he's wanting of us, we find that the answer is to lay down our lives for others. That means putting others first. That their needs are more important than our own. Two weeks ago, Paul told us that when he reminded us of the simple picture of uh, that joy is Jesus first, others second, ourselves last. Jesus taught us that the way to live according to the Father's will is to die to self and be alive to Christ. It's not something you can work at. It's not something you can force yourself to do. It comes from the work of the Holy Spirit within you. He will prompt you to care. He will point out that need. He will encourage you to do something to meet it. It's the work of the Spirit within you. He will prompt you to take those little or big actions for the sake of another. He will urge you to speak that word of encouragement or be there in that moment of crisis to show you care. (coughs) By your fruit you shall know them, said Jesus. The one who abides in me will bear much fruit. It's living in Christ that we find we want to express our love for him by loving actions we show to those around us. That's the work of the Spirit. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but action and in truth, says verse 18. And love is the key word of the Godhead. It's the expression of the relationship of Father, Son and Spirit to each other. And it's the expression of the relationship between the Godhead and the repentant sinner. God loves you. It's the love of God that reaches into your heart and through your heart to the world around. It's the feelings behind the tears that Jesus um, shed as he wept over Jerusalem. He knew they would reject his love. And crucify him. But still he went to the cross. Because of his love. And the expression and outworking of his life in your heart. Will show in your attitude to others. You are to reflect him. Of course you are conscious of how much you lack in love to others. Of course you are aware of the poverty of your loving actions. There's a verse in one of the old hymns, I think it's at even when the sun was set, but I haven't got any hymn books these days, so I couldn't check it out. But this is what it says. Those who would serve him best are conscious most of wrong within. And that's true in our experience. You will be most aware of how far short your life comes. But let that encourage you to pray all the more that Jesus' love will fill your heart so that you may be as Jesus to those you meet, a friend to serve. And thirdly, there's a temptation to flee. We go back to verse 6 in this chapter. The authorised version says, whoever abides in him sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither know him. That's a bit hard, and we wonder how we can cope with that. The NIV softens it a bit. It translates it, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. And in these verses 4 down to 10, there are some very hard words said about sin, which at first can leave us feeling guilty. Or even doubting our faith. Uh, 
You say, well, I thought salvation came through the cross and all who give their lives to Christ will be saved. Yet I still sin. How can I reconcile this to this teaching of scripture? And the answer lies in the Greek tenses, but we won't worry you with the details of that. Just understand what the passage says. Everyone who sins breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. And John isn't talking so much about the little wrong things that we do by day by day. He's talking about the whole act of rebellion that lies behind it. At its basic, sin is rebellion against the rule of God. That's what it was in the beginning. Satan wanting to take God's place. And that's what it is in our heart and life too. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler when he came asking questions? What's the greatest commandment? Was the question. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And then Jesus added as a bonus, and the second is like it, to love your neighbour as yourself. That's what we've been looking at. That's what we've been seeing. The fact to depend on is the love of Jesus shown for us in the cross, which brings our response to him of worship and adoration and lordship. That's loving the Lord, your God, with all your heart. The friend to serve is Jesus' second commandment, to love one another. What are the keynotes, then, of a life unresponsive to Christ's love? It's a life centred in self. Self reigns on the throne of that life. The central action and ambitions of that life are all aimed at the throne of me and what I want. You say, well, not everybody I know is like that. True. But have you noticed how, as the influence and teachings of Christ have become less relevant to the life of society, how society is moving more and more to the reign of self. It used to be the word of the gentleman. Now it's, I want that in writing, please. The rights of the individual has replaced what's best for society. The morals of the nation are gradually eroded away. Ambition is to be achieved regardless of who I tread on or able to get where I want to be. But when you give your life to Christ, you vocate, uh, sorry, vacate the throne of self and you ask Jesus to be the centre, to be the Lord. That changes the whole perspective. So that your aim now is to please him and to serve him and this affects your attitude to others. That much we've already seen. John is here warning his readers of the danger of slipping back into that self-centred attitude and lifestyle. We do continue to sin when we transgress and allow self to come to the fore in any given situation. We trespass against him when we wander off the path of what we know to be right and follow a new attraction. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we twist a given situation to our own advantage, putting our rights before others' needs and pushing what's best for me rather than how does Jesus want me to be in this situation. And whilst we're in our human state in this life, there's this constant war going on in our heart between Christ's reign and the self-reign of our natural human state. The saving factor is that we have the Holy Spirit to prompt us to avoid that temptation. We have the Holy Spirit to make us feel uncomfortable when we've taken that step that we know we shouldn't. We have the love of Jesus which calls us to come and confess it before him at his feet so he can cleanse it away. He gives us the strength and the grace to confess it to him 
to apologise to others when we've wronged them. John's warning is to be careful that we listen to the voice of the Spirit and not ignore him. The more you ignore the Spirit, the harder it is to hear what he's saying. The harder it is to hear what he's saying, the further we get away from our fellowship with Jesus. The further we get away from our fellowship with Jesus, the easier it is to slip into ever deeper sinful ways. The temptation to flee means that we must take the step of repentance as soon as you recognise the wrong. Keep your list short. When things go wrong, confess it. Put it right. Restore the fellowship with Christ and with others as quickly as you possibly can. You want to walk in fellowship with Jesus? Give your life to him. If you doubt you're walking in fellowship with him, do it again. Commit yourself daily to him. Remind yourself of who is Lord and remind him that he is Lord of your life. When he's on the throne of your life, you'll want to help others and show your love for Jesus by the way you show your love to them. Pray daily for greater love for others, the same love that Jesus has for them. And beware of the constant temptation to let self back onto your throne. It doesn't get easier as the years go by, believe me. You may recognise the temptation quicker, but dying to self and living for Christ is a constant battle. And Paul talks of the armour we need when, uh, if we are to achieve the victory. But praise the Lord, Jesus is coming again. Many signs indicate it won't be long. Rejoice that when he comes, he will complete the victory in you and you will reflect his likeness. And meanwhile, pray, come Lord Jesus, and believe he can use you in the work of his kingdom. Let me conclude by telling you of Edward Trimble. I'm sure if I asked you to raise a hand, there wouldn't be one if you'd heard of Edward Trimble. He was a Sunday school teacher with a little group of boys of 13, 14. Most of them behaved quite well. There was one lad who was very difficult. And in that town, in a, that, that week, there was to be a special mission and Edward Trimble wanted the boys to go and he gave to each of the boys an invitation except the one lad who wasn't very easy to handle. He knew there was no good taking the invitation to the home. Ed, the lad would never have got it. But he knew that the boy worked in a shoe shop. And he was a bit worried about taking the invitation there in case the employer was uh, not very cooperative. He walked up and down the shop, uh, outside the shop several times before he opened the door and went in. He gave the lad his invitation and he left as quickly as possible. But the boy took note of the invite and went to the meeting. At the end of the meeting, he went forward and gave his life to Christ. And in due course, he began to preach. And together with his friend, Ira Sankey, the Sankey and Moody missions began and spread throughout America, uh, America and came to Britain too. D.L. Moody may be a name you've heard of. When I began ministry, we still sang their hymns in the Sankey hymn book. Another young man called Billy was influenced by D.L. Moody and he trained for the ministry in due course and became an evangelist. And in his lifetime, he preached to more people in more countries than any other preacher in the whole of Christendom. For the ministry of Dr. Billy Graham took him to an enormous number of countries, preaching to thousands at every rally. When I went into college, a whole number of the students there had all been converted at Billy Graham rallies. And they in their turn went out to churches and ministered to communities in the name of Christ. And so the ripple spread. But it all began by a shy Sunday school teacher who no one's ever remembered their name. I have to look it up every time I use this illustration. 
God can use you, you see, and you never know what effect it may have or where those ripples may spread. The fact is, believing that you can be used, you can serve him as you serve others. Behold, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And we can when we serve him.